Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Raina. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. In this special Digital Ophthalmic Society takeover of Peer to Peer, the podcast, Dr. Eric Rosenberg, co-founder of the Digital Ophthalmic Society, hosts Dr. William Wiley, director of the Cleveland Eye Clinic, to discuss how digital innovation is and will continue to reshape ophthalmology. Let's dive in. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, thanks for tuning in to this uh, episode of uh, Peer to Peer uh, with the DOS and Digital Takeover. And um, it is my huge and sincere pleasure to be hanging out with uh, William Wiley here, director of the Cleveland Eye Clinic. Um, and uh, we get to discuss innovation, but I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, though. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, honored to be here and discuss innovation. You know, I'm um, a cataract refractive surgeon in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, medical director of the Cleveland Eye Clinic, and uh, I've been doing cataract and refractive surgery for about 20 years, and it's amazing to see the evolution of what's happening in, uh, in in our space. We've seen a lot of technology advance, which it's been super exciting to be involved in cataract refractive. But most recently, we've seen this sort of emergence of digital into eye care and into eye surgery. And we're just start. I mean, it's, it's been going on. It's been an evolution, but it seems to have accelerated, let's say, over the past few years. And it's exciting to see the power uh, at our fingertips and what's happening in the digital space. So that kind of leads me to you, Eric, and back to you is sort of what is the Digital Ophthalmology Society, uh, DOS, and, you know, explain what's going on there. I know you've uh, been a big player in the space, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. It's really an honor and privilege to be here with you. I'm, I was pretty much reading your papers and um, everything you put out regarding all the advancement of cataract surgery and refractive, uh, pretty much since I've been in the womb. So it, it's really fun to be here uh, with you today and talk a little bit about the DOS. Um, so the, the DOS is a multifaceted organization uh, dedicated to the integration and development of technology into the ophthalmic sector. So uh, if you will, it's, it's a unified voice. A digital is nothing new to ophthalmologists. We've been using digital technologies for quite some time. Um, and that's why I was alluding to uh, reading everything that you and uh, your, your colleagues have been producing over the last you know, decade. Uh, it's it's been really wild and awesome to see. Uh, the one thing that appeared to be missing was a, a collaborative environment that people could share ideas um, and kind of have a unified voice going forward. And the pillars of the Digital Ophthalmic Society is not just educating uh, new and um, developing surgeons on on how these technologies work and interact but really to help set some policy and, and have it so that not just the doctors, but the industry sector and the insurance and the payers, we all work together to create a, a really good platform that advances. Um, it is really a privilege to say that uh, DOS has evolved over the last year or two, um, whereas I was privileged enough to help create it with John Kitchens uh, out of Kentucky. Um, now we're, we've integrated into the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, um, and it will here, hereby be known as a digital committee led by none other than the, the great John Hovenessian. We thought there was definitely a niche here that we needed to explore um, and be able to run ideas past each other, because as you know, um, we have all these individual technologies and uh, a lot of times they don't work together well uh, or if at all. And, uh, you know, sometimes we need to start leveraging some of that data that we have. Uh, there's a lot of questions that we still ask uh, day in and day out. There's some things that we need to explore a little bit deeper. So, um, you know, I guess I can turn around the question on you. Why is discussing digital and technology as it relates to ophthalmology important for all of us going forward? Yeah, I mean, you're right. There's so many aspects uh, how digital touch touches our lives and, and touches ophthalmology. And to make sure that those things are all coordinated in a unified effort, I think is important. You can look at aspects simply, you know, say the EMR and recording. Okay, that's great. But, you know, you're looking at 
ophthalmic equipment. And I, I, I can tell you that there's still probably the majority of the equipment I use prints out a piece of paper. And then we have to then scan that into our EMR, which is seems antiquated in, in this day and age. And we need to kind of push, let's say, even that simple diagnostic aspect forward. And so, okay, maybe now my topography can be printed or scanned directly. And maybe it talks to my EMR, but even that's a step short. We still, it might just be being scanned as a PDF, but we don't see it uh, from a digital aspect. There's so much rich data behind uh, the scenes, behind that PDF that's going, it's housed in, in, let's say that topography. We need access and integration into our EMR. And so that might be, a, a, again, a step forward. But then let's say looking at maybe my data or my topography data compared to, let's say, worldwide data. Can we apply that and look at how is that being used from patient to patient? We can go way, way further than what we're doing now. We're just barely scratching the surface. And that's just even just talking about diagnostics. You know, you can look at how it's digital touching on surgery. Dr. Kitchens has been integral in using, let's say, 3D heads up for intraoperative guidance, let's say, for surgery. And even that, we're sort of almost barely scratching the surface. We're almost working in more of an analog world where, yes, we're doing 3D heads up video, but are we capturing data in the OR? Are we inputting preoperative data? Is it being used in a digital way? I look at my iPhone and how I take a picture of my iPhone. I can apply multiple filters. It can scan. It can recognize faces. It can recognize animals. We're not having anything close to that uh, in the OR with, let's say, the current digital scopes. But I think we will get there. Uh, we're just recently integrated um filters where I can boost blue color. So if I'm using inter, uh, cap, or, uh, capsular stain, I can boost those colors to kind of highlight certain structures. And that's maybe the analogy that we might have in our iPhone of applying a filter to a sunset to get a better picture, better image. So anyways, those are just some, some examples of where we're seeing digital uh, expansion and improvements. But again, it seems like wherever we turn, there's still a lot of room to grow. Uh, and I think we're just, you know, tapping into, let's say, the power of computers, the power of AI. And uh, going forward, I think we'll see sort of uh, exponential growth in this realm. Absolutely. And it um, gets me, at the very least, very excited. Um, you know, as we enter this realm, before it was like little... Niche pockets, OCT, topography, all, all these individual digital technologies that existed. And I mean, they're invaluable, right? We wouldn't be able to live life without them. Um, but then as they started accumulating, it became a little bit cumbersome. And that's, I think, what you're alluding to, where, you know, we, we have all these technologies. We're scanning papers. I mean, how archaic is that, too? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the financial industry is is bouncing uh, you know, signals from satellites off the ocean to another satellite to be able to save a fraction of a second to, you know, save, you know, $3 on a trade. Um, but we're printing off sheets and scanning it in. So um, I, I love that take where there, there's definitely a lot of room to grow and we need to um, because the technology is there. You're seeing it in in your own hand, in your cell phone. Um, you know, I'm scanning, just like you, scanning in those PDFs where, you know, before I was sitting there doing my own books by hand. Um, now ev everything is actually in the palm of your hand and the technology is there too. Um, so it, it seems time to start integrating that into daily practice. So uh, what changes do you think are necessary in the industry um, that would help us drive through digital technology? Yeah, I think um, one one key piece you mentioned, we've talked about the cell phone and patients are functionally walking around with a communication device that we have a direct access to that patient. And we have yet to tap into that uh, on a widespread manner, but, I, but I've been, been impressed from, with some of the new technology that we're seeing. Uh, Rainer, for example, has a new software called Ray Pro that um, allows patients to be funneled into a uh, uh, post-operative survey questions, and you get that subjective feedback on how patients are doing in their post-operative course. So a lot of times, 
we might have an idea how a patient's doing. We might think, okay, they're seeing well for distance, but how are they really doing for intermediate or near? How are they functioning on a day-to-day basis? And to be able to tap into that uh, patient database and uh, correlate that to their functional and objective outcomes, but a- adding in this subjective piece uh, on a, in an easy way. And then you, know, you can compare different lens platforms and saying, okay, well, I think this EDOF lens is delivering a good outcome, but I might just be going off of anecdotal uh, reports. And I remember the last patient that was either happy or unhappy, but to be able to have all my patients input into the system and say, okay, well, uh, objectively look at there's 75% of these patients are functioning without glasses for these tasks. I think that can then allow that, that doctor to kind of understand, okay, you know what, I am making an, an improvement or further than that, you might be able to uh, look at, let's say my 75%, but track that or compare that to worldwide data. They might be like, well, Wiley, you're kind of behind 90% of the patients using this kind of lens are, are functioning, let's say, without glasses. And so I think um, seeing that um, ability to have this widespread access to patients and that patient reported outcome in an easy way and have that being uh, transmitted to the doctor, but not only to the doctor, but you know the doc and worldwide colleagues. And, and you have this comparative benchmark that might be easy to use and allow for uh, improvements in either style or lens choice or technique and things like that. I love those asynchronous events. Uh, that's something very unique to digital technologies that we didn't have before. Um, oftentimes it was just always the physician and surgeon. And I know that I have patients that come to me and tell me that they're happy. And then when they leave or they're waiting for me in the waiting room, I I overhear them saying that they are unhappy with the outcome, but they they either don't want to upset me or something. I don't know what it is. Um, maybe enough people are complaining in general, but (laughs) when I, when I go in the room and I ask them how they're, how they're doing, they're like, everything's great. Um, and now with these asynchronous events, uh, you know, we can start to harness more time points along the scale of the patient care and also uh, take that data into consideration. And what does it mean, not just for one day, one week, one month, you know, but five years, 10 years down the road for me and hearing what you're saying, I love, I love, love, love these asynchronous events that we were not able to do in the past uh, that we'll be able to do in the future. That leads me to my next question. What future changes do you think we can expect to see due to digital innovation? Doctor to patient education um, and peer to peer education. Um, we're seeing a sort of a transition. I think traditionally um, we might have peer to peer education that would go to, let's say, a published peer reviewed journal article. And that might take from the time you complete a study to the time that journal is published, that may be a year. Uh, tra- uh, that's transpired, and uh, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time. Uh, then you know, maybe you can throw away journals that are a little quicker to print, maybe a month. Live meetings, but live meetings may only occur once a year. Uh, you can go to different meetings and get that information, but it, it, there's still that time frame. Now with uh, social media, we're seeing the transmission of uh, information from peer to peer happen almost on a day basis. You can see a doc holding up a new box with his lens saying, hey, I just put this new Rainer EMV lens and outcomes were great. And they're holding this box. And now all that that doctor's colleagues reach out to them and say, okay, well, tell me about the results. How are people doing? And you have that immediate feedback. And I see social media being used in that manner. I think traditionally, I think we all sort of thought as social media as a way to keep in touch with maybe friends and family, which it is a great tool for that. But I'm starting to see it more and more being used for peer-to-peer interaction. And what's cool about that is you have sort of this dual aspect of your maybe transmitting and educating your peers, but then patients have access to that same uh, information. And so you're sort of dual purposing that social media where let's say traditionally, if you put something in a throwaway journal, it definitely works for peer to peer, but a patient may not understand that you may be an expert at one certain technology. Your, your peers may know that, but the patients may not. Uh, in a social media realm, you have access to that uh, education that's being delivered everywhere. And so that can be good, but it can also be bad. You have to be careful what, what you put out there. Uh, I think it's important for doctors to understand it's a, a very powerful tool. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're seeing that aspect of digital being used for this peer-to-peer and or peer-to-patient education. 
it's a tricky landscape because they're sharing too much information, not sharing enough. I've really liked um, that a lot of the societies have started embracing discussions around that. Um, but again, you know, it, it happens synchronously, uh, you know, two times a year where you go to the meetings and you listen to what those lectures are. So I, I guess a good question for you next would be, where do you think is the best place to educate yourself uh, with these innovations uh, that are occurring in ophthalmology on the day to day? Obviously, services like uh, Digital Ophthalmic Society, DOS, is a great resource that is, you know, has the finger uh, thumb on the pulse and is looking, you know, uh, what is coming next. And that's a great resource uh, to, to tap and uh, to see the collaboration with that and organizations like ASCRS, journal articles, throwaways, you have social media, all these different resources. But it's nice to have this unified um, you know, source with uh, DOS that's going to be on that leading edge and digital within medicine and eye care. So not to put you on the spot, um, and I'll answer it first, um, just based on yes. how I feel. I, I would almost argue that going to the individual or, or industry partners um, for some of the information uh, as it relates to some of this interoperability, interconnectivity, um, leveraging of uh, AI and big data is, is going to be a really important play. You know, I've always felt that um, working with our industry partners is important, but I think it's going to be even more important um, going into the future because in my personal opinion, I feel that medicine has left the realm of it being a one dog show where, you know, the, the lone eccentric surgeon will fly his helicopter in and say that this machine is the way to do uh, cataract surgery. I'd, I'd almost argue that it's a multidisciplinary team um, by experts in their fields. And while we all may have multidisciplinary backgrounds, or even if we don't, we specialize in one element of it and to have that collaborative um, team uh, behind you and understanding what you know, industry partners are putting out. I, in my personal opinion, I think it's going to be a really good place to get information. I don't know if you feel the same way on that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think we're, we're seeing this paradigm shift where large data is going to start taking over and it's imperative for surgeons to work with industry and industry to work with surgeons and to collaborate on that data collection. And we really just haven't seen that effective. Uh, and um, I think though, going forward, it's for sure going to happen. And, and it's a must have for everybody to play in that space to uh, because the rate at which we'll learn will just accelerate even on top of that. We really appreciate you being here with us. We always love watching you push the needle and thank you for, for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And thanks for all you've done in this space and being such a leader in this realm. And uh, it's helping. Uh, we're all going to benefit from the work you have done in this area. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for this DOS takeover of Peer to Peer, the podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please take a minute and click subscribe before you head off. That way you'll know when the next episode arrives. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer Hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rainer does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labelling and instructions for use for Rainer products in all cases. Not all Rainer products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.